You may remember a story I told back at the beginning of the series that we started out of the book of Acts. That was 46 weeks ago, so you may have forgotten the story. Uh, We're going to finish one day, I promise. The story is about a woman in Afghanistan. She's a female journalist. There's not many of those in Afghanistan. And after the Taliban overthrew the government and took over in Afghanistan a few years ago, nearly every female journalist in the country fled. But she stayed, and she was asked by an American reporter why she would dare to stay in Afghanistan, even though she was at great risk being there. And she said, I want to continue my struggle. She said, if I leave, who will be the voice of Afghanistan? Now, I love her clarity of purpose. You sense it? I've got one job. That's to be the voice in her case, of her country. I think that story is really helpful when it comes to thinking about what the book of Acts is all about for you and me. The whole thing is about the calling to be the voice or the witness on behalf of Jesus in the world. So let me show you this. This is in Acts chapter 1. This is how the book starts. Jesus gives a promise, and he gives us our purpose here in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Look at this. But you will receive power. That's the promise. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, here's the purpose. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then the book of Acts ends like this. You jump all the way to Acts chapter 28, verse 28. Look at how the book of Acts ends. Therefore, I want you to know God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, And they will listen. That's how the book ends. So the book starts by saying, God is going to fill you, believers, with the power that comes from the Holy Spirit so that you can speak on behalf of the Lord and tell the good news of Jesus. And then the book ends with this promise. When you do that, some people will actually listen to you. They'll hear you and believe what you're saying. Okay, so you recognize that's what's going on in Acts. We've been reading through Acts, and you see person after person sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, and you recognize that that's a great thing to do, but man, isn't it awkward to talk about Jesus? A friend of mine called me the other day. He's a minister in another town. He was asking about something we do at Highland. I was like, why are you asking about this? He said, well, I'm working on this book. I was like, well, what's the book called? And he said, how to talk about Jesus without it being super awkward. Man, I resonate with that. Does anybody else resonate with that? In fact, it can feel so weird to talk about Jesus to somebody who's not a believer that we tell ourselves, I don't know that I have to actually talk about him. I mean, can't I just live well, and that that itself will be compelling enough that they'll want to know about Jesus. Can't I just live a good godly life? And I'll tell you, I think living a good godly life, good godly life is incredibly important. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, he says, watch two things closely. Watch your life and your doctrine. In other words, he's saying it's not enough to just believe or say the right thing. You have to actually live it out. And when you don't live it out, it takes away all the saving power of what you're saying. Okay, but when your life matches up with what you're saying, there is great saving power in that. Okay, so your life matters. But listen to what he's saying. It's when your life matches up with what you are saying saying that there's power in it. And so in some ways, it's kind of, I'll just be really honest, it is too convenient for me to say, I'm going to live a good godly life, and that's enough. Okay? That's about half of it. Okay? And the other half is, what do I say? So if I was going to subtitle this sermon, something besides what was on the screen there, I would subtitle it, How to Talk About Jesus Without It Being Super Awkward. Okay, and I want to challenge you to talk about Jesus. Come with me to Acts chapter 17. I think this is the most important passage in Scripture, perhaps, on how to talk about Jesus in this world today. 
This is Paul in Athens, a world that in so many ways is, our, is like ours. Listen to this. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And so he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. And some of them asked, what's this babbler trying to say? And others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And then they took him and they brought him to the meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. Now, look at this next line. Look what's in parentheses here. This is in the Bible, and it's worth paying attention to. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. We're going to come back to that. Paul stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus, and he said, People of Athens, I see in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and I looked carefully at your objects of worship, your idols, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Man, so you are very ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. I asked David Jackson and Alan Black. David Jackson is one of our shepherds. Alan Black is one of our longtime ministers here. I sat with them a few weeks ago to talk about this particular passage to kind of pick their brains. I said, what's the problem? Is the problem idolatry? Or is the problem ignorance? And one of them said what I'm going to share you, and I think he's exactly right. I don't remember which one it was. So one of them's really smart. The other one, I don't know. So one of them said this. Let me throw that up here on the screen. He said this. In in Athens, idolatry is the symptom of their ignorance. In other words, they're worshiping the wrong thing, idolatry, because of what they don't know, ignorance. I want you to think about that and just look at it for a second. Back in Acts 15, the Jerusalem council, the leaders of the church, send a letter to all these brand new baby Christians, and they advise them not to do some specific things. And all the things they advise them not to do are things that are tied up with idolatry. And the message is really clear. Listen, everybody's on board. Everybody come on in. But hey, don't worship things that aren't God. That's not okay. You and I were made for the praise of his glory. This is the reason we exist. What's going on in Athens is that they are worshiping the wrong thing. They're violating the reason God has made them. Why? Because of what they don't know. All right, and this should surprise us. Because you remember what I I noticed there in parentheses, or I, I drew your attention to there in the parentheses? All the Athenians do is spend all their time sitting around doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. When I read that, you know what I thought? Facebook. Facebook. Not everything you read on Facebook is true. It's true. The problem, though, is not that there are true things about Jesus online The problem is that those things are drowned out and flooded by what is not true. And so like the Athenians, we don't live in an age where we're short on information. We live in an age where too much information is bombarding us. And so we struggle to process through what's true and what's untrue. And because we become convinced by what is not true, we end up worshiping the wrong thing because we don't know what is true. Does that make sense to you? Okay. The universal temptation, I think, when we encounter somebody, and let's go back to social media, when we encounter someone on social media who doesn't know what I know, what is the temptation? To bash that person. To bash them. To say, how could you not know what I know? How, I mean, what are you thinking? That's the temptation. Look at what Paul says when he encounters this kind of ignorance. He says, people of Athens, I see you are very 
religious. Instead of starting with dishonor, instead of bashing them for what they don't know, what does he do? He starts by honoring them. He recognizes they're worshiping the wrong things. How does he start? I love that you guys want to worship. That's awesome. That is awesome. I love that you're hungering for something transcendent, for truth, for meaning beyond yourself. That is great. He starts by honoring them. Years ago, this very famous theologian, he's a guy who thinks about God, was doing a lecture at a university, and after the lecture with all these students, there was a question and answer time. His name's Paul Tillich, by the way. And one by one, these little students would come up to the microphone, and they would ask Paul Tillich a question. And what the moderator noticed was that every time a student would ask him a question, he would kind of change the question. He would reshape it, restructure the question until very clearly it was a question he liked, and then he would answer that one. Near the very end, the moderator goes, ah, Dr. Tillich, that's, that's not exactly the question he asked. Would you mind answering the questions the students are actually asking? And he said, no, because they're not asking the right questions. Okay, how many of you have felt like that before? Yeah, some of you have felt that way. Okay, but think about the dishonor in that room at that moment. Why in the world would I want to listen to what this guy has to tell me about Jesus when he has said that thing about me? All right. All right. And that brings us to number two. Paul starts with honor, and then he considers the questions they're actually asking. And this may be the, the most kind of substantial part of this sermon. I want us to dig in here and to kind of explore this. He answers the questions they're actually asking. Now, like Dr. Tillich, he probably wishes they were asking him different questions. He probably wishes the Athenians were coming to him and saying, hey, you know, I just have this feeling that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Do you know one? But that's not what they're asking, You're right? The way he examines what they're asking is that he pays attention to what we might call like the, um, back in school, they would call these the cultural artifacts, which is a fancy term for what are they reading? What are they watching? What are they listening to? The things that capture in a bottle the Athenian culture, what are those things? So he pays attention to those things and based on those, he's going to identify what questions they're asking or what desires they really have. So come with me here. Pick up in verse 24. This is Paul. He's going to talk to the Athenians here. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else from one man. He made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. And God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any one of us. And then pay attention right here. For in him we live and we move and we have our being. That's not a quote from scripture. That's a quote from a Greek poet named Epimedes, okay? As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring, another quote from another Greek poet. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the whole world with justice by the man he has appointed. That's Jesus. He introduced him earlier. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. And when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, well, we want to hear you again on this subject. And at that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became believers, followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, and a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Is anybody else, when you read this, and you compare this to all the other speeches by Paul and the other apostles and Acts. Does anybody else look at this and say, where's the scripture here? In every other speech in the book of Acts, it is full of quotes from scripture. Why is that? Every other time in the book of Acts, he's talking to who? Jews or God-fearing Greeks, who are people who read what? 
the Bible, okay? So these are people he's talking to who have already decided that this book and the words in this book are holy and authoritative in my life. And so if you can show me within these words why Jesus is the truth, then I'll believe you. But the Athenians do not believe that this has any value on their life. They don't believe that this has any power in it at all. Are they wrong? Yes. But does he quote scripture? No. Okay, because it's not the right place to start in this case. He alludes to scripture in multiple ways. But to say these words aren't holy and valuable to them is not to say that there are no words that are holy and valuable to them. Who does he quote? He quotes their poets. He quotes the inscriptions on their idols. This would be like the songs that they're listening to, the YouTube videos that they're watching, the viral social media posts. He's quoting the things that represent their deepest desires and hearts. And he uses those things to identify their real questions. Oh, you want to know who the God is that made you? You want to be close to that God? You want to be connected to your Father? Those are your deep desires. Well, let me talk to you about how Jesus makes that possible. All right, so what would it look like if I were to do the same thing today? Because you and I know there's a lot of people who don't think this has any bearing on their life. Are they wrong? Yes. Okay. How would I start, though, a conversation with them? Well, I'd start with honor, and then I want to consider the questions they're asking. How do I figure those out? Well, I pay attention to what they're listening to, what they're watching, what they're posting. Let me give you an example. Uh, They're the most popular song in the world right now. is a song by a guy who a couple months ago was totally unknown. Posted it on YouTube. Anybody know what it's called? Rich Men North of Richmond. Okay, a phrase you never thought you would hear on Sunday morning at the Highland Church. Uh, the song has over 50 million views on YouTube, 50 million views, okay. And uh, number one song in the country. Okay, let me give you a little geography lesson. Do you know what town is north of Richmond, Was- Washington, D.C.? And so the song is basically a criticism of how those rich men, politicians, overlook, don't care about, undervalue the working man like him. Okay, that's, that's what the song is about. Okay, now immediately, you and I want to jump in and either agree with the song or critique the song, okay? And, and there's room for both those things, both those impulses. Let me just challenge you to say, instead, what does the desire of this song speak to in the human heart? 50 million people have watched it. Clearly, he's tapping into something. What's he tapping into? That feeling that we have, that I don't matter to the people in power, that they don't care about me, that nobody knows what I'm going through. Okay, well, what I'd wanna tell him is, it doesn't matter what rich man is north of Richmond, he's not gonna care about you, right? But there is one, the king of all kings, who knows exactly what is going on in your life and cares deeply about it. Right, okay, so what you desire will be totally unsatisfied by this world, but there is one who satisfies. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Okay, let me give you another example. The, uh, one of the largest grossing concert tours of all time, most successful concert tours of all time was this summer. Did anybody go? It was who? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Another not normal example for me to use on Sunday morning. You know, there you go. Uh, I was reading an article by this Christian mom who went to the Taylor Swift concert, loves Taylor Swift. And uh, she was trying to figure out, why can I not quit Taylor Swift? And she said, I think it's because I've grown up with her. Like I was a teenager when she was a teenager. I'm a young woman now, and she's this young woman. And, and she just gives me this vision of what it's, what's possible, that it's possible for you to grow up and mature and change and to navigate difficult relationships and overcome them and kind of like hold yourself together. And I, and I want to say to all, all those young folks who love Taylor Swift, and she's, yeah, she's really catchy, right? I, I agree. Okay. Taylor Swift is not going to help you grow up. But the promise of Jesus is that by his Holy Spirit and his word, you might be built up. 
and able to withstand what this world throws at you, which will often be much harder than a boy that breaks your heart. Right? So your desire there is right and good. It's just not satisfied by what this world offers. Okay, and so this is what I think Paul's doing. This is what he's doing. He's paying attention to what they're engaging with and why those things, how those things speak to our heart's deepest desires. And he's saying, it's not bad for you to desire that. Just what you want or what you believe will fulfill that desire won't. But there's one who does. There's one who does. Now let me tell you about him. All right, so come with me. That brings me to point number three. So if number one is to start with honor, number two is to consider their actual questions and engage those. Number three is what I'm going to call get to Jesus. Get to Jesus. So if idolatry is a symptom of ignorance, what they don't know, then what they most need is not kind of a, a mutually respecting conversation with one another where we both exchange ideas with each other and we, we leave agreeing to disagree. What they need at some point is the news that Jesus has been appointed judge over all things. And because he's been appointed judge over all things, it is not okay for us to agree to disagree. You have to respond to this news. So let me throw this up there on the screen. This is Acts chapter 17, I think, starting in verse 30 here. Look what he says. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Why? For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. Jesus, he introduced him earlier. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Okay, like here's the truth. The knowledge that God has raised and appointed Jesus over all things demands response. Demands response. Why did God send Jesus? Well, Paul tells us God did this so that we would seek him and find him and reach out to him, though he is not far from any one of us. God didn't send Jesus just because he thought it would be fun. Right? He sent Jesus because he desires all people would turn to him and be saved by him, and to know him through Jesus. So any conversation that starts with honor, that considers the real questions, but doesn't get to Jesus, falls short of the calling of what it means to truly be a witness. To truly be a witness. And that is what he's called us to. So let me throw these up there on the screen really quick. I want to end with these, and I'm going to give you a question, pray over you, and we're going to finish in worship. Let me say this. If I want to talk to somebody about Jesus without it being awkward, I want to start with honor. I want to honor their desires, their person, who they are. I'm going to start with honor. I don't want to bash them. Two is I want to consider the questions they're actually asking. I want to pay attention to their heart's desires, what they long for most. And three, I've got to get to Jesus. Because the good news of Jesus demands response. It's not me that demands it. Who is it? Jesus. I want to say a prayer over you. I want to invite the praise team up. And as I pray over you, here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to picture the person in your mind, in your life, one person who's far from Jesus Christ right now. What that person, man or woman, doesn't know is that Jesus is very close to him or her. I want you to picture that person. I want to pray over us as we picture that person. We're going to end in song. God, we believe that you have called us to be your witnesses. To, yes, to live a godly life, but not to stop there, but to share what is good news, your good news, the gospel of Jesus. Give us boldness. Give us power. We believe, God, that we will be heard when we speak in the power of your spirit. Help us not to shy from it. That person in our minds right now, God, would you prepare their hearts? Would you even right now work in their hearts to show how their desires, their deepest desires are unsatisfied and cannot be filled without Christ? Plant that seed now, God, and give us boldness that we would go to them maybe even this week. I pray this. In the name of Jesus, amen.